Testing, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three. All right, yep, we are live back here on the Hot Light channel. And if you are here, you are here to see Carl von Clausewitz on war part two. Right, so this will be uh, part two of what will be, I think, four parts that I'm going to do for Carl von Clausewitz and his famous treatise on war. Uh, for those of you coming back after watching part one, thanks a lot. Appreciate you tuning in for that. If you haven't watched part one yet, recommend you hop back, give it, give it a look, and then uh, join us uh, back here for part two. But in any event, uh, we're here for part two, and uh, this part will be um, dedicated more to the readings themselves. Uh, I will spend less time on uh, history and uh, background, although I will uh, go into a little uh, here before we start. So yeah, parts two and three uh, will probably be more um, reading focused, and uh, I'll provide the go-bys uh, for you, uh, as I always do. And then we'll discuss uh, after each passage. So anyway, uh, let's get into uh, a little background uh, for On War itself, and then uh, we'll jump in. So uh, we know that On War was written between 1815 and 1830. You might remember that from part one I mentioned. But it was published in 10 volumes, and uh, the publishing took place over the course of uh, 1832 to 1837. So yeah, uh, over five years, readers were given um, two volumes per year. I guess that would work out for the average. I think that math is uh, correct. So people could look forward to two new volumes of uh, von Clausewitz's work uh, each, each year between 1832 and 37. And we know that the publication happy, happened because of his widow, Mary von Clausewitz, also known as uh, Marie, uh, Countess von Brühl. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, she published these works uh, posthumously for Karl, but failed to add his revisions that he had hoped to make. This is probably through no fault of her own. She just grabbed whatever he had um, officially compiled into On War and then brought those to the publishing company and they released them in a limited series. Uh, his revisions most likely were just notes he had kept uh, here and there, uh, things he probably wished to add later on in life uh, as he fine-tuned everything. Uh, but because of that, On War can be considered an incomplete work as it stands because the author never got to make the revisions himself. So it's really hard to say how On War would have looked five, 10, 15 years subsequent to uh, 1837 and, uh, and even further beyond that. Uh, but in any event, uh, because On War, uh, as, its, as its original form, uh, because it's so well regarded, um, it stands as an incomplete work, right? We would, I, I think anybody who writes would be considered fortunate to publish something that's considered incomplete, but it's still uh, heralded as one of the most famous, famous works on the topic of war. And uh, that's definitely true for uh, von Clausewitz's uh, book on war. It's probably considered one of the most famous works on the topic of war, second only to Sun Tzu's Art of War. And if you're interested in that, I did a three-part series uh, for Sun Tzu's Art of War back uh, in Christmas of 2020. So I recommend you give that a watch too. Just saying, it's probably pretty good. Anyway, um, what are the main uh, themes behind von Clausewitz's book on war? Well, in the first part, and we went over this, uh, war is merely the extension of one's policy, be it a, uh, a country, be it a coalition of nations, be it a tribe, what have you. War is just an extension of one's policy. What is your policy? That we rule the world. Okay, well, how do we do that? We get everybody to surrender and then we just, uh, we rule. Okay, what if they don't? Well, then we make them think about surrendering with economic and political pressure. Okay, what if that doesn't work? Well, then we go to war and we kick their ass. That's just a continuation of policy. It sounds crude, it sounds you know pretty simple, but it's, it is that simple. Uh, war is just an extension of one nation, one country, one people's policy. Uh, and then you have the fog of war. And the fog of war is essentially um, what exists uh, on the battlefield or in a series of battles and 
what the individuals experience on the ground as it's going on, right? The best example uh, that I think you could you can probably find, and it does a very good job of this, uh, cinematically. Actually, I would say two. Uh, there is uh, the opening scene for Saving Private Ryan, uh, which is D-Day when they land on Normandy Beach, uh, and it's complete chaos. Like from from Jump Street, bullets are flying into the PT boats. Guys are jumping over the side. They're drowning because they can't get their gear off and they, and they, and they don't know how to swim uh, because, you know, back in those days, like not everybody was getting um, uh, neighborhood swimming lessons where they grew up. So either you knew how to swim or you didn't. And maybe if you jumped into the waters off of Normandy Beach, you found out that you couldn't swim and that's where you died. For the guys that made it to the beach, they're all scattered. It's like their company is literally 50 yards apart. They're screaming at each other. Bullets are still whizzing in. People are trying to get up to the beach or get behind some cover, and it's chaos. It's complete and utter chaos, and this is the fog of war, meaning you had a plan, you went to go execute the plan, and then everything went tits up. Well, that's the fog of war, and through the fog of war, you need commanders who are brilliant, and we'll read about that in the next, in the next few passages, who are brilliant enough to see through the fog of war and make judgments and decisions despite how thick this fog might be. And that's very important. And that leads to the third theme, and that is uh, friction as a condition of war theory meeting reality. Uh, the second movie I mentioned, uh, was going to mention was Last of the Mohicans, when there's that famous scene where um, I think um, the British troops are leading a caravan through a valley, and they are ambushed by the French and Indian uh, coalition um, as they, as they try to make their way through this, this meadow and it's complete chaos, and which is exactly what an ambush is supposed to do is create chaos in your opposing force so they can't muster a uh, sizable um, resistance. Uh, that's a good movie too. Go see Last of the Mohicans and uh, Saving Private Ryan. I and mean, if you haven't seen those movies yet, I don't know what you're doing, but go see them. Uh, but yeah, friction as a condition of war theory meeting reality, which means this fog of war happens when your war theory, your strategy, is put into practice, but then it's tested in reality. And as von Clausewitz says, there's a lot of great war theory out there. Some of it's sound, some of it's theoretical, completely theoretical in nature. It's never been tested. But what happens in reality is what should always dictate your war theory going forward. If your theory isn't working, it's not, the, it's not the reality that's the problem, it's your theory. And the friction is what happens between armies and their objectives, right? Our objective is to take this city. Okay, well, I have a war theory as to how we can do that. All right, well, when we got there, the reality threw your war theory out the window. What's your new war theory? The friction is trying to figure out how to change your war theory into realizing the reality of the, of the objective. And again, as he says, and as we'll find out, the military genius is the one who's able to do this, and that's why they're so valuable. Okay, let's go to the readings. And here we are, yet again, on war. Uh, yep, all 10 volumes right here, and 1837. You know, um, it's, it's still as relevant today as when it was written, because these concepts, just like the concepts that Sun Tzu discusses in Art of War, they don't change, right? People don't really change, just the times in which they live change. In the sense that um, we're right now in 2021, we still have the same wants, desires, fears, and hopes that mankind had a thousand years ago, right? We don't want to starve. We want to we wanna be happy. We want to be free. We want to experience a full life full of love and joy and fulfillment. And we want to avoid pain. We want to avoid sadness. We want to avoid um, the, the vices in life. Even though they come naturally, we, we, we seek to avoid those vices. And war, unfortunately, despite being an extension of policy, is considered an evil. So we seek to avoid war. But luckily for us, Karl von Clausewitz condenses what his understanding of war is so that the reader in his day or the future could hope to better understand and deal with it when it came. All right, let's go. And we jump to page 45, and this is under chapter 3 on military genius. Von Clausewitz said, 
In any primitive warlike race, the warrior spirit is far more common than among civilized peoples. It is possessed by almost every warrior, but in civilized societies, only necessity will stimulate it in the people as a whole, since they lack the natural disposition for it. On the other hand, we will never find a savage who is as truly great a commander, and very rarely one who would be considered a military genius, since this requires a degree of intellectual powers beyond anything that a primitive people can develop. Civilized societies, too, can obviously possess a warlike character to greater or lesser degree, and the more they develop it, the greater will be the number of men with military spirit in their armies. Possession of military genius coincides with the higher degrees of civilization. The most highly developed societies produce the most brilliant soldiers, as the Romans and the French have shown us. With them, as with every people renowned in war, the greatest names do not appear before a high level of civilization has been reached. Okay, so some might consider this culturally insensitive or even uh, bigoted, but unfortunately it's true. So <clears throat> what he's saying here is that in primitive societies or uncivilized nations, you will find the warrior spirit in every single heart of every single member of that army because they live, in primitive, they live in primitive circumstances, right? It means starvation's real. Getting your head caved in by some guy's club is real. Having your wife stolen or sold into slavery, that's real too. It's primitive, it's ugly, it's brutal, it's short, like Hobbes would say. Like the Leviathan in his, in his work, in the book, you know, the state comes in, the sovereign is necessary because man's nature without a governing body, especially in, in a sole ruler like a sovereign or a sovereign monarchical state, is going to resort to the primitive warlike um, circumstances of people who live in faraway lands, uh, speak no language and, and have no written word. Uh, the Leviathan, the, the sovereign, keeps everything together, keeps things working smoothly because civilization is literally only one, a civilization is one catastrophe away from going, going extinct. That was Hobbes. John Locke would disagree. He would say, man is actually, is actually pretty good and we don't need a state to tell us to, uh, how to act. But that's a discussion for a different day, Hobbes and Locke. But uh, von Clausewitz is saying here that in primitive societies, the warlike spirit, the warrior spirit exists in the primitive cultures through, throughout the entire army uh, it has because there is no other way. It's not a place for weaklings. If you live in the Stone Age and saber-toothed tigers are after you and you have to bring down a woolly mammoth to eat for the week, well, you're going to be a warrior or you're going to die. And that's just the way it is. In civilized societies, especially, let's say, in the West in 2021, we have too many comforts. We have refrigeration that keeps our food cool and preserves it for days on end. We have television to entertain us. We have air conditioning when it's hot. We have uh, uh, heating when it's cold, right? We have literally every single comfort that man could seek as far as making his life easier to bear. So we become soft. We lose that warrior spirit. But nations, peoples that develop this high level of civilization they have to develop the mind before they get there, right? Because no one is going to invent refrigeration or Wi-Fi or air conditioning or heating or indoor plumbing if they don't have the you know, hardware up here. So civilized nations become soft and lose that warlike spirit. And he says they only develop it out of necessity, meaning they're gonna freaking die if they don't find the warrior spirit. So it comes out of necessity. But the military genius that comes is a product of that civilization's um, intellect, of its national character, of its overall national IQ. And that's where you get civilizations like ancient Greece and Athens and Sparta. And that's where you get civilizations like Macedonia and Rome and Napoleon's France and Great Britain during the Victorian era where people said that the sun never truly set on the British Empire because it was that vast. Civilizations that advance will produce military genius, but they will also lose the warlike spirit in the average man. But you will not find military genius in primitive cultures simply because 
if the cultures are primitive and are stuck in that state of being primitive, you don't have any geniuses because the genius that exists in that culture will drag it out of the Stone Age and into the Bronze Age, into the Iron Age and forward. And that's just a fact of life. Civilized nations produce military genius. Primitive societies produce a multitude of warriors. Germanic, cold hard facts, but that's the way it is. Okay, moving on. We jump to page 46 right after. And von Clausewitz said, If we pursue the demands that war makes on those who practice it, we come to the region dominated by the powers of intellect. War is the realm of uncertainty. Three quarters of the factors on which action in war is based are wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. A sensitive and discriminating judgment is called for, a skilled intelligence to scent out the truth. If the mind is to emerge unscathed from this relentless struggle with the unforeseen, two qualities are indispensable. First, an intellect that even in the darkest hour retains some glimmerings of the inner light which leads to truth, and second, the courage to follow this faint light wherever it may lead. And that's pretty inspiring. But it's also true. So now we're talking about the cultivation of military genius in civilized societies. And what he's saying here is that the powers of the intellect dominate in this realm, especially where you have a state that is considered in the fog of war. As in, we are now embroiled in this war. It's a continuation of our policy but we've, we've come to a position where we aren't sure where to go. If we go this way, we could win. If we don't go that way, we could also win. What do we do? Do we stay where we are or do we go there? Or do we go this direction? Any direction we go could lead to victory, but it could also lead to defeat. If we stay put, that could also lead to defeat as well. We're in this fog. We need a military genius to help us learn the truth as in, that's the right way to go, trust me on this, I'm a genius, and the courage to follow that truth wherever it may go, no matter how faint the light of that truth is. So what you're saying, what, or he's saying rather, is military genius is not simply being a smart guy. It is knowing which way to take your country, which way to take your country's armies, and following that direction no matter how faint the light of that direction may be. But it's your beacon, it's true. It's like, are, we, are you sure we're going this way? Yeah, I'm positive. Okay, uh, I don't know if this is the right way to go. And everybody starts to talk amongst themselves and they doubt. He's like, nope, I see that light, I know it's there. I, I, I'm certain about, I, you have to trust me, follow me to that light. That's the courage of your convictions, to have the in intellect to see that light, but to also have the courage to follow it, that is military genius. To know and to go, to believe and to see. You have to have both. Um, military genius is not just theoretical, uh, it is practical. And that is uh, von Clausewitz's uh, point here, is that the military genius is, is distinct from all other types of genius in the world because life and death is on the line. If he gets it right, everybody wins and he's a hero. If he gets it wrong, well, everybody might be in, uh, facing the gallows the next day. It's a lot. It's a lot of risk. It's a, it's a lot of risk. And even if he's rewarded with a victory, he's soon forgotten if another war takes place or another, another loss soon follows it. He has to be right every time. And if he's wrong even once, it could mean doom for uh, his army and for his country. All right. Let's move on. This is on page 48. And von Clausewitz says, Determination, which dispels doubt, is a quality that can be aroused only by the intellect and by a specific cast of mind at that. More is required to create determination than a mere conjunction of superior insight with the appropriate emotions. Some may bring the keenest brains to the most formidable problems and may possess the courage to accept serious responsibilities, but when faced with a difficult situation, they still find themselves unable to reach a decision. Their courage and their intellect work in separate compartments, not together. Determination, therefore, does not result. It is engendered only by a mental act. 
The mind tells man that boldness is required and thus gives direction to his will. This particular cast of mind, which employs the fear of wavering and hesitating to suppress all other fears, is the force that makes strong men determined. Men of low intelligence, therefore, cannot possess determination in the sense in which we use the word. They may act without hesitation in a crisis, but if they do, they act without reflection. And a man who acts without reflection cannot, of course, be torn by doubt. Okay, so now he's talking about the military genius. And as I said, uh, following on the earlier passage, the ability to see the truth of the light in that direction and the courage of his convictions to follow it wherever it may go or how faint it might be. And determination, uh, this is a great line. He says, um, some may bring the keenest brains to the most formidable problems and may possess the courage to accept serious responsibilities, but when faced with a difficult situation, they find themselves still unable to reach a decision. This is the intellectual who knows the difference between the truth and uh, falsehood, who understands through the fog of war which direction has to be taken. And he's determined because he sees that he, this direction is correct and he knows the responsibilities. But when push comes to shove, right, when the metal meets the road, he stops and he hesitates and he doubts or he doubts to the point of um, lack of faith in himself. And because of this, he doesn't have the requisite determination. He has three quarters of what is needed, but that last quarter is to take what he knows and to just let it all hang out and to go for it. Meanwhile, von Clausewitz talks about the, um, you know, the well-intentioned dope who's you know, brave as all get out, but he, he's dumb. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't reflect enough. He's, he's that guy who says like, uh, okay, what do we have to do? Well, we have to get in that house. He's like, all right, my plan is this. And then, then he just starts running full bore and headbutts the door and crashes the door down through the house, bailing through the, the, the opening of the house, through the hallway, and then he gets shot by someone waiting for him. He's like, okay, well, all right, that didn't work out. You know, Bobby, God rest him, heart of gold, you know, brave as anybody could ever hope to be, but not the brightest. He had the courage of, a, of his convictions, right? He said, okay, we got to get in that house. Well, uh, I see a door. Let's go through it. It's like, maybe that's not the right way to go, Bob. But he goes anyway, and he hits, and he hits that door full speed, goes straight through it and into a trap, and now he's toast. Okay, that's not military genius. That's bravery. That guy can be put to good use, obviously, because he's just a wind-up toy. You turn that crank and you send him and he'll go. But he's got to be given the proper direction. You can't just let him make up his own mind because the first thing that pops into his head will sound like a good idea and then he'll just charge headlong into certain death, not caring, and that doesn't really serve a, a greater purpose other than you know, he goes out in a blaze of glory. So military genius is seeing what needs to be seen through the fog of war having the courage of your conviction to follow it and getting everybody else to see what you see and follow you. That's military genius. It's more practical than theoretical. Okay. Let's move on now to page 53. Von Clausewitz writes, Lastly, we come to men who are difficult to move but have strong feelings. Men who are to the previous type like heat to a shower of sparks. These are the men who are best able to summon the titanic strength it takes to clear away the enormous burdens that obstruct activity in war. Their emotions move as great masses do, slowly but irresistibly. These men are not swept away by their emotions so often as is the third group, but experience shows that they too can lose their balance and be overcome by blind passion. This can happen whenever they lack the noble pride of self-control or whenever it is inadequate. We find this condition mostly among great men in primitive societies where passion tends to rule for lack of intellectual discipline. Yet even among educated peoples and civilized societies, men are often swept away by passion. Just as in the Middle Ages, poachers chained to stags were carried off into the forest. Strength of character does not consist solely in having powerful feelings, but in maintaining one's balance in spite of them. Even with the violence of emotion, judgment and principle must still function like a ship's compass which records the slightest variation, however rough the sea. Yeah, so 
what he's saying here juxtaposed against the uh, incredibly brave but slow-witted um, compatriot who just runs headfirst into the doorway. The man who can most be of most use on the battlefield is the one who feels emotions strongly, deeply in his heart, but is slow to embrace them. They're there, right? They, they, they burn like a fire, but not like an inferno that, that carries him away. As he says here, and it's a great line, I'm going to misquote it. He says, their emotions move as great masses do, slowly but irresistibly, right? Like think about it like an ocean, like a tide, right? You cannot hold back the tide, but the tide rolls in slowly. It takes, you know, the course of a day, but the, the weight of the ocean is behind it. These are men of great emotion, but also men of great intellectual discipline. They know how to harness their emotion, right? Because it serves them a, a very good purpose, but they must never let the emotion take over and break their intellectual discipline. Because as he says, it's definitely possible for intellectual societies to produce military genius and for that military genius to be carried away by emotion. Whereas leaders in primitive societies operate almost entirely on hell-bent emotion. It is just bonsai charge and we're gonna take that hill. Uh, who the hell cares what happens? I don't care if I lose 90% of my men, we are gonna take that hill and we're gonna win. That's passion, but it's carrying you away. You need to be slow to release that passion, harnessing your emotions through intellectual discipline and using both in uh, conjunction with each other. To be a man of great emotion and to be a man of great intellectual discipline is necessary for a military genius and it's necessary for any civilized nation's army to prevail. Okay, let's move now to page 59. Von Clausewitz says, The great range of business that a supreme commander must swiftly absorb and accurately evaluate has been indicated in the first chapter. We argue that a commander-in-chief must also be a statesman, but he must not cease to be a general. On the one hand, he is aware of the entire political situation. On the other, he knows exactly how much he can achieve with the means at his disposal. Circumstances vary so enormously in war and are so indefinable that a vast array of factors has to be appreciated, mostly in the light of probabilities alone. The man responsible for evaluating the whole must bring to his task the quality of intuition that perceives the truth at every point. Otherwise, a chaos of opinions and considerations would arise and fatally entangle judgment. Bonaparte rightly said in this connection that many of the decisions faced by the commander-in-chief resemble mathematical problems worthy of the gift of a Newton or an Euler. Okay, <clears throat> now he's speaking of the commander-in-chief, be it a president, be it a supreme allied commander, uh, a king, uh, a prime minister, what have you. Uh, they must be statesmen, right? Because as we s said in the first part, war is merely an extension of a nation's policy. But any nation that finds itself in a continued or prolonged state of war is a nation that is probably going to lose or worse yet, be conquered entirely because they depleted itself. War is a policy, but it cannot be a way of living for any nation, no matter how belligerent. So war as an extension of a nation's policy must serve a purpose and it must be a means to an end, a defined means to an end for an explicit purpose. The commander in chief as a statesman is also a politician, but he must never forget his role as the supreme allied commander, the commander in chief for a, as a general would, would be in war. And he must never fail to realize that because he is winning in a war doesn't necessarily mean that he should give up his duties as a statesman. On the flip side, as a statesman, he should never neglect his duties as a general as it applies to war. Because as these policies become uh, harder to work or harder to realize, sometimes war becomes the only policy available. And if a nation is starting to succeed in war, maybe war can take a back seat and other policies can take its place to, to better serve uh, his country's ends. But the commander in chief must never give up these two roles. If he becomes too much of a politician, that, that state, that nation could fail on the battlefield. If he doesn't, 
if he doesn't embrace his role as a politician, as a statesman, and simply looks at himself as a general, he could possibly plunge his nation into a state of perpetual war, which, as Sun Tzu would say, has benefited no nation in the history of mankind. So to be a proper commander-in-chief, a military genius, he must wear two hats at the same time, that of the statesman politician and that of the general. All right. Next segment here. We jump to page 74. <clears throat> Von Clausewitz wrote, The conduct of war, then, consists in the planning and conduct of fighting. If fighting consisted of a single act, no further subdivision will be needed. However, it consists of a greater or lesser number of single acts, each complete in itself, which, as we pointed out in Chapter 1 of Book 1, are called engagements, and which form new entities. This gives rise to the completely different activity of planning and executing those engagements themselves, and of coordinating each of them with the others in order to further the object of war. One has been called tactics, the other strategy. According to our classification, then, tactics teaches us the use of armed forces in the engagement. Strategy, the use of engagements for the object of the war. Okay, that's a great definition. A lot of people probably get that confused, right? Tactics are kind of like strategies, right? Or are strategies more like tactics? <clears throat> None of the above. So war is the series of engagements as a whole, right? As we said in part one, combat can be condensed into uh, several or a multitude or perhaps even one incidents of kinetic warfare. As in my side meets your side on this battlefield, on this date, and we, we go at it. And whoever wins that engagement is the victor for that particular engagement, that combat. That is an engagement which could be a which could be one part of a series of engagement uh, in, in the particular war. Tactics are what you use in those individual engagements. And strategy is the use of engagements for the object of the war, right? So think of it like subdivisions. War is literally the entirety of all the engagements we find ourselves in. That's why you get the... the, uh, the adage, it's better to lose battles if it means winning the war, right? You will sacrifice certain engagements, you will uh, surrender or cede certain battles if it means ultimately you can win the overall war, just like chess. Nobody will miss a pawn if it means you take your enemy's king, right? You'll lose all your pawns. You'll lose almost all your pieces if it means at the end you can still put your opponent's king in checkmate. That's the whole object. So it is with war. Engagements are combat. Tactics are what you use in those specific engagements. And winning or losing certain engagements is your overall strategy for winning the war. I'm willing to lose this entire series of engagements if it means I can win this series of engagements. Because these 10 engagements are important, but these 20 engagements are vital. If it means losing these 10 to win these 20, that's a fair trade. That's my strategy for the war. My tactics in those individual engagements are what I do to win or perhaps uh, beat a hasty retreat. It's all up to what I'm faced with as it, as it pertains to terrain, uh, manpower, resources, weather, etc. Tactics are what you use in individual engagements. Strategy is how you use those engagements to win the overall war. Simple as that. Okay, next we jump to the final reading for this uh, part on war. And this is under uh, the section, A Positive Doctrine is Unattainable. Page 89, Von Clausewitz said, Given the nature of the subject, we must remind ourselves that it is simply not possible to construct a model for the art of war that can serve as a scaffolding on which the commander can rely for support at any time. Whenever he has to fall back on his innate talent, he will find himself outside the model and in conflict with it. No matter how versatile the code, the situation will always lead to the consequences we have already alluded to. Talent and genius operate outside the rules, and theory conflicts with practice. I like that one. 
It's very un-Germanic, actually. Uh, it's 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 more um, it's more in line with Sun Tzu's um, more uh, esoteric philosophical understanding of war. Uh, and here he's simply saying that listen, friction is what happens when your war theory meets reality. Uh, when you fall back on your innate talents, your military genius, that should be your scaffolding. Not some theory about war that you got taught from a book in a classroom, uh, right, which you were given a, a, a diploma at the end of that uh, series of courses. That's BS. That might serve you, but it's not necessarily, as he calls it, the scaffolding on which you can rest and build your war strategy. Up here is where your war strategy lies. And it's ever changing because it must change with the conditions of the war, otherwise you will lose. And when he says here, it's fantastic. No matter how versatile the code, the situation will always lead to consequences we've alluded to. Talent and genius operate outside the rules and theory conflicts with practice. Talent and genius operate outside the rules. That's the very definition of genius. Genius is the ability to take what we know as a species, right? Factual knowledge, but apply it to things that have not yet been discovered or things that have not yet been uh, theorized or things that have not even yet been dreamt of and say, we know this about the world. I believe there is something that exists outside those rules that can be later learned, developed, and joined to our body of knowledge so that it exists uh, for posterity. Electricity, for example, right? 150 years ago in von Clausewitz's era, he was writing this book by candlelight or an oil lamp. Little did he know, 50 some odd years later, somebody would be developing electricity to light up uh, every individual home uh, in America and beyond. Uh, it would have been a lot easier for him to write his book if he had a light bulb uh, lighting up his desk versus an oil lamp or a candelabra. Genius is what took illumination from what we knew by candlelight or oil lamp and said, I think we can take what we know with illumination and apply it in a avenue that has not yet been discovered or that has only been theorized. But it takes a genius to go that far, to follow that light, pun intended, and to uh, keep following it no matter how far it goes, no matter how many twists and turns uh, will we'll, uh, accompany that person on their pursuit of that light and to have the conviction to attain it. And that's where genius is. Genius is the ability to take what is known and to apply it beyond to areas that are not yet known. And that's how we get progress. That is why countries that have genius level intelligence have literally gone to the stars. Uh, and why countries or nations or civilizations that cultivate genius among their ranks can rely upon that genius bearing new fruit in the future and taking existing knowledge and applying it to other areas that have not yet been dreamt of by average minds. And as von Clausewitz says, such is true with the fog of war. You know these are the conditions. Who can get us out of here? it's a military genius that will get you out of there and nobody else because he is looking in areas that other people either haven't yet thought about looking or number two, have looked but didn't know what they were looking for and didn't know what to see. And von Clausewitz was a military genius so I think he knows what he's talking about. Okay, that's gonna do it for uh, part two uh, for On War. Um, hope you're digging this series. Uh, I'm, I'm liking it too. <laughs> the more I read these, the more I, you know, I get invigorated by it because it's, it's very good. Um, it's very good um, exercise uh, for the brain muscles, uh, especially if you're uh, a fan of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Von Clausewitz is a fantastic companion uh, to Sun Tzu uh, for the Art of War because On War takes a lot of the philosophical understandings of war, but Puts the, uh, puts the flesh on the skeleton that Sun Tzu uh, developed a thousand years prior. And it's, it's, really, uh, it's really cool to juxtapose the two against each other and to really see how both men coming from very different civilizations, very different schools of thought, 
still came up with essentially the same understanding of what warfare was, and it's just the human condition. And to understand it, you really have to understand, you know, mankind as a species first before you can hope to understand the activity or even the principles of war. Okay, great. Uh, once again, this is the Hot Bite Channel, part two on war. Stick around. Uh, hopefully, I'll get part three out here sooner rather than later. I know part two took a while. But uh, in any event, if you're liking this, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel uh, if, you're, uh, if you're liking this series or any of the other series I've done. And uh, yeah, we'll see you uh, back here next time. Till then, take it easy.